This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Hide.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first-class VPN. Go to Hide.me slash Epicenter and sign up for a free account today. Welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technology, projects and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today our, our, our topic is, is very interesting. We are going to talk about the DAO and some of the security challenges that were discovered with its design. Joining us to walk through this topic are Vlad Zamfir and Emin Gunsirer. Both of them wrote a paper calling pointing out several security flaws in the DAO and calling for a moratorium on, on proposals right now. So uh, Professor Seerer is an uh, Associate Professor of Computer Science at Cornell University and Vlad is a researcher at the Ethereum Foundation who works on Casper and the blockchains and their blockchain sharding solution. So before we start, let's have a small intro from the two of them, starting with uh, Gun. Hi, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, let's see, I'm an associate professor at Cornell University in the computer science department. I work on building self-organizing systems in general, and um, I've also worked on all sorts of things related to cryptocurrencies going as far back as 2002. Um, you might know me from such epicenter Bitcoin episodes <laughs> as Selfish Mining. I was one of the two people who uh, discovered the Selfish Mining attack on Bitcoin. and. Um, since then, I've done quite a bit uh, on uh, trying to make the Bitcoin ecosystem healthier, better. Uh, this includes building the new thing that we call covenants um, and uh, the Bitcoin vaults for securing money at rest, Bitcoin coins at rest. I've also worked on Bitcoin Next Generation, which is a, a new protocol that is based entirely on the same exact code, uh, sort of underlying infrastructure as Bitcoin, um, but uses a trick to get around the block size limitation so that uh, it can achieve uh, latencies for one confirmation that are as low as uh, on the order of a few seconds, and throughputs that are limited solely by the underlying network, not by any block size restriction. So um, that's, I'm also a co-director of the, uh, what is it, IC3, which is the initiative for cryptocurrencies and smart contracts. Hey, I'm Vlad. I'm a researcher at Ethereum. I'm, I've been working on proof of stake for like uh, over a year and a half now and uh, also started working on blockchain sharding and a few other things here and there. Cool, so how, how did you guys uh, end up writing writing this paper, pointing out the security flaws in the DAO? Why did you analyze the DAO at all? So it first came to my attention that there might be like some security problems with the DAO when Dino Mark, I had a conversation with Dino Mark, who was like the third author on the paper. And he uh, he's the one who kind of, uh, led the charge by initially writing a documentation of like how the DAO works and a bunch of attack vectors. Uh, and that's like what eventually kind of turned into this call for a moratorium. Um, so I, I was speaking with, with Dino about it. And then I was also uh, hanging out at Cornell uh, to work on Casper and, you know, Goon and I got to start talking about it and we realized that it was something that we wanted to work on in the short term. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the amazing thing here too is just the speed at which this happened. You no, know, a few weeks ago, this was well, kind of started as this way for the Slocket guys to get some money, and then all of a sudden it took on this massive life as it, of its own, you know, becoming the biggest crowdfunding campaign ever, and and I was very skeptical to be honest. Um, but what has been amazing for me to see, and I've only sort of followed it a little bit as an outsider, unlike uh, the three of you, is how much involvement and how a community has arisen sort of instantly to you know, dissect it and criticize it and make other proposals. And, and it was particularly amazing to see, for example, that original security proposal that the Slocket guys made, and then immediately detailed analysis of all the things that were wrong with it on blog posts and Reddit and, and hundreds of comments and discussions. So actually that made me a lot more optimistic about the project It's just kind of seeing all the activity uh, that went into that from all kinds of different people. So I entirely agree. So it's, it's a sign of health that uh, these things are being dissected so quickly by, by you know, a, a million eyeballs essentially. And it's, again, a sign of health that uh, people are uh, taking this thing seriously, looking at it carefully, trying to make it better. 
Hopefully we'll come out, out of this with a much better DAO that people actually understand and have some assurance in that it, it implements what they have in mind. Just another thing that I find interesting here, maybe worth mentioning, is right. So there was always this idea of you know what's the DAO like, what is the best application for a DAO, right? and where is it going to be used? And it's interesting, kind of right now, that the DAO or this first decentralized autonomous organization that's kind of really getting traction and being used. It actually doesn't really even have so much of a function besides being a decentralized autonomous organization and making some decisions, right? And that, that being completely vague, uh, what they are, I mean, okay, there is the presumption that it's going to act a bit like a, a venture capital fund with some similarities there. Although at the same time, right, you could imagine it doing other things as well. Uh, so, so I think that's just a, it's an interesting thing to think about that maybe wasn't so clear, right? I think if you'd asked people before, what is a DAO going to be? Uh, what's the first successful DAO going to be? I don't, I'm not sure if this would have been the one. Well, so th that is true. Um, on the other hand, I'm not so surprised about the turn of events that the DAO turned meta uh, and then that the, one of the first proposals is all about managing the DAO itself. And it seems like uh, substantial effort is going to go into making the DAO better. This is exactly what you would expect with any cool new technology, that the very first steps you take are shaky and uncertain, and uh, people will go into it and try to make it better and, and much more robust. So uh, you're absolutely right uh, that we're in a sort of a funny, funny situation right now. DAO isn't necessarily funding uh, big money-making proposals being brought in by contractors, but is instead trying to make itself better, and that, that's a good thing. Absolutely. I think from that perspective, it's also a, a positive aspect that they raised so much money because that allows them to kind of do that. If they had raised whatever, $3 million and they had spent the first $2 million on making the thing itself useful, then that would have been a very unattractive thing for investors. But, you know, if they, if they raise on the $60 million, they spent $10 million or $20 million on making the thing itself actually um, useful, then that could, could actually work. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that idea, but I certainly don't. I hope it doesn't cost that much money to make this thing work. I mean, uh, I, I hope I hope that like you know, with a few relatively easy to implement changes, it would be a lot safer than it is now. Uh, and then with a lot more changes, it could be really just like orders of magnitude better than it is now. But you know, it's like we have to acknowledge that this thing already already is live, and we have to kind of, uh, you know. Uh, deal with that in a kind of short-term basis. We can't just kind of put everything on hold for like a couple of years while we do a lot of research into like the optimal DAO architecture. Yeah. So, uh, so we'll be walking through now on kind of what are these kind of attacks and problems uh, that uh, the two of you have identified with the DAO. But before we start, perhaps it makes sense to just have a broad overview. Like Brian mentioned that this is meant to be the DAO is meant to be a sort of a VC firm, right? Something that invests in, in, in projects. It's a mix of between a Kickstarter and a VC firm. But assuming that our listeners have that basic background, let's kind of go into some of the details of uh, of the DAO, like, you know, what uh, what is a curator uh, and, and questions like that. So maybe we should start with just describing the role of the token holders and the curators. What 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 should token what are token holders of the DAO tasked with doing and what are curators of the DAO tasked with doing? Okay, well at a very high level, the DAO is something uh, like a mix between a venture capital firm and um, and Kickstarter, as you mentioned. So what that means is, uh, like a venture capital firm, it has raised money from uh, the public, and uh, it's going to invest it in projects of different kinds. Those projects come to the DAO in the form of proposals and uh, they get voted upon. This is where it differs from a traditional venture capital firm where you would have a, a professional fund manager make decisions. Um, instead, with the DAO, the decisions are being made by the token holders, by, by participants, investors in the DAO. And uh, these people vote, and their votes carry as much weight as they have tokens in the DAO. So the more you invest in the DAO, the more you have a say on how it spends its money. And uh, the money then is allocated to proposals. 
Um, the critical difference between Kickstarter and this is in Kickstarter, you're putting your cash and your cash alone towards the project. In the DAO, you're voting with your share and you're committing other people's money towards projects if the votes uh, are above a certain voting threshold. Okay, and, and Vlad, what, what do you think is the role of the curator out here? Can you describe that? Um, so, I mean, at, at very least, I can describe the, uh, the, the, like, uh, the mechanism of the curator that's encoded in the DAO as like a contract. Um, so the, the, the curator manages a whitelist of payment addresses to which proposals can be made. So the DAO can only basically like send calls and cryptocurrency to addresses on a whitelist and the curator contract manages that whitelist. It can add things to the whitelist and it can remove things from the right whitelist. Um, so the curator is just this contract that has this ability as far as the DAO, DAO is concerned. Uh, but in today's DAO, the curator is also is a, a, a 5 of 11 multi-sig that uh, you know has the ability to add and take away members from the multi-sig and also to change the threshold required. Um, so, uh, and then and then what is the role of the individual curators or part of the multi-sig is something that um, you know is still still kind of being defined as a little uncertain, and I think that is a uh, you know a whole other rabbit hole that maybe we should save for after we talk about talk more about how the DAO works and the attacks against the DAO, etc. Okay, so so we have walked through like the token holders. So the token holders are people who kind of invested money during the creation phase of the DAO, now hold some tokens and then can vote on different proposals to spend money on certain projects. Then you have the set of curators which define like high level, which addresses can claim money for uh, for spending on, on projects on the DAO. So now whenever a, pro a proposal uh, comes in, then it has to first get approved by the curator and then only can it really apply to the DAO and have a have a voting phase in. So allocation of money is decided by voting, right? So uh, the final the final component of the DAO that we might want to walk through is the is the notion of a split. So Goon, can you explain to us the notion of a split and what it does? Sure. Um, so the purpose of a split is to allow people to take their money out. And um, uh, the DAO follows a particular, what we would call a pattern um, in software engineering, where you don't just get the ether out as soon as you demand it, but instead, uh, the way the split works is the bigger DAO contract splits and creates a child contract. And you become uh, essentially, if everything goes according to plan, you become the sole owner of the smaller DAO and uh, your, the rewards that were coming to you in the, in the mother DAO uh, start going to the child. And in the child, you are the sole curator, and you can do whatever you want. And in fact, uh, if you really want your money out, what you would do in the child is you would put up a proposal to take all the money out to pay yourself, and then you would approve it because you're the only voter. Uh, you have 100% of the votes, and uh, you would then get your money out. It's uh, thus a slightly complicated process. It's not as trivial as just saying, I want my money back. Uh, that you have to go through the DAO creation phase uh, and then the proposal phase within the child um, to get your money out of the, the mother DAO. And, yeah, and uh, just, uh, just quickly say something about yeah. that as well. Um, the, initially, the, the way that like Christoph uh, concept and like the, the soccer team conceptualized splitting is as a way to uh, defend against a malicious curator that like, a lot of the DAO would coordinate to kind of jump to this new this new DAO that had a different curator, um, but p since then people have reconceptualized it to, as being like you know if I don't like what the DAO is up to I can take my money out, and that's why we we've been kind of been left with this awkward withdrawal mechanism, because initially it wasn't intended as a withdrawal mechanism and now it's being adopted as one. Because one one of the reasons that I could interpret this. Uh, so maybe maybe I'm wrong here, right? It's because like let's say you invest money in in this DAO, and initially you should just be able able to take the ether back out. But now this has been invested in a variety of different projects that over time will will pay back into the DAO returns there. So I should have some way, presumably, right? If I take my uh, if I want to take my money out, to then still receive the rewards. So is, is that that? But that was not the reasoning why you'd have a separate DAO that then these rewards would get redirected to. Yeah, so I mean, you, that, that is like the, the child, like the children DAO can claim rewards from the parent DAO uh, for th money they've already spent on proposals in the past. 
I mean, so for returns on funds they've spent in the past. Let's take a short break to talk about Hide.me. Look, when you're choosing a VPN provider, you want to make sure that your privacy is protected. You know, if a government agency tries to force the VPN provider to hand over some of your traffic or, ban or, or browsing information, will they be able to do that? And is your payment information attached to the account? These are all things that you want to consider when choosing a VPN provider. With Hide.me, all that's taken care of. For starters, they're based in Malaysia, and Malaysian laws don't require them to keep any logs. In fact, Hide.me has no logs of your traffic or browsing uh, history. So even if a government agency was trying to force them to hand over some information, they would be straight out of luck because Hide.me has nothing to give them. In addition to that, they use a third party, party payment provider, uh, which uh, doesn't give them any of your payment information. So they have, they have no way to link an account to like a credit card or a PayPal account. So even if you're paying with PayPal or credit card, there's no way for Hide.me to know which account paid for what. And of course, if you're paying with Bitcoin, then you're completely transparent. Uh, so what we suggest is if you're creating an account with Hide.me, if you want that extra level of privacy, just make a fake Gmail address and use that to sign in. So that way you're completely anonymous. You can give Hide.me a try with their free plan. Their free plan includes two gigabytes of data at unthrottled bandwidth. You can use any of their free exit nodes, which are in Amsterdam, in Singapore, and in Montreal. And you can sign up for that at hide.me slash epicenter. Now, if you use our URL, and if you decide to go premium down the line, it's gonna get you 35% off. And the premium plan gives you a lot. It gives you unlimited data. You can use as much as you want. You can connect up to five devices, so your whole household fits on the plan and you can use any of their exit nodes all over the world and they've got like 30 of them. And of course, you can pay with Bitcoin. So give it a try. We would like to thank Kite.me for their support of Epson and Bitcoin. So what kind of complications does that add, Vlad, that you said originally the idea of a, children, a child's doll was to replace the set of curators, but now that it's being kind of used in a different way? I mean, so it's made it so that like the withdrawal process is complicated and that you need to start worrying about like this like soccer issue, which we, uh, sh I guess we should talk about now that it's kind of come up, which is the, uh, the concern that like any of your attempts to uh, split uh, alone, you might have someone follow you or also end up on the same thing and then you have, wouldn't have a majority of the uh, shares t so that you couldn't pass proposals. So... To be, to be very clear about this, uh, the way the stalker attack works is suppose I want to, you know, I've had enough of the DAO, I don't want to be part of it anymore, and I want to, to take my money out. The recommended procedure is to split. So I initiate a split, and uh, normally the expectation was that uh, I would be the sole person who would uh, go for this child DAO where I, I alone am the curator. But a malicious person can follow me. And uh, he, can, he can vote yes on my proposal to split. He can enter my new DAO, my child DAO with me. And now suddenly I'm no longer the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of the, uh, the owner, the com complete controller of the child DAO. And this stalker that, that's next to me, that's following me around, is now in my DAO. And if he comes in with enough funds, he can actually overpower me. He can reverse my decisions. And... Uh, such a stalker with, with large enough funds can actually just squat in my DAO and, uh, and now I'm at a loss, like what, what do I do? Um, and there are a bunch of things that have been suggested. Uh, the Slocket team has a, a web page that says the stalking attack is a non-attack. Uh, but there are two issues with it. For one, there is certainly the, the potential for financial loss. If I split again from the child DAO to a grandchild, then I lose the rewards because the rewards don't carry down through the generations of DAOs. They, if I leave the child, then I've left it behind as an empty shell. And my rewards that I was getting from the mother DAO into the child, I left them, I abandoned them to my stalker, and he collects a bounty. So that's a big problem. Um, the stalker could also follow me into the grandchild. And then this is a denial of service attack. Now I'm unable to take my money out. He could actually start to try to ransom me. And so that's a problem. And, uh, and uh, there are technical tricks that one could play. They're all probabilistic. They all rely on race conditions and timing and so forth. They're very complex. 
And, uh, and I think that your typical investor is going to be hard pressed to, to pull them off. And, um, and so I don't think that this problem has been addressed uh, sufficiently yet. Vlad, go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, uh, I, I completely agree with you, Gun. Uh, I, I just, uh, you know, would like to go into just like a little more detail about like what these like tricks are. Basically, the idea is that like if you can get your money into the, your DAO or into your split uh, at the last block of the creation period of the DAO, then, you know, the attacker won't be able to follow you because they'll have to get in at the next block. Um, and basically, to do this, you need to like guarantee that like you're only going to get in if the attacker hasn't already gotten in before you and you're only going to get in if it's at the last block. Um, and you're, no, the attacker also isn't going to get in at the same block as you. Um, so like, you can make sure of all of these things, especially if you're mining your own block. Um, but it's, it's, it's difficult, and one of the, re the only way to make it work without like, risking losing your rewards is to start many, many, many different split proposals and to split many, many different times, but only to follow one of them. And uh, the issue with this is that this is going to cost a lot of gas. So it's going to be costly, and it's going to require writing programs to monitor the blockchain and to inject the right transactions at the right times. So uh, personally, I think this is a, a no-go. This is not a reasonable way to build a system. In, in, when we build large distributed systems, the kinds of tricks that we're talking about here to defend against a stalker, we call them race conditions. They are dependent on timing, at being there at the right time. Um, I'm sure almost everybody who listens to this podcast has experienced some race condition or another. Most of the time, my Windows box, I don't have a Windows box anymore, but when I used to run them, most of the time they work okay. On occasion, you get a blue screen. And that blue screen happens because the things ended up timing just right for some code to get messed up. So um, you don't want your, the safety, the security of your funds to be dependent on these kinds of, of, uh, of payment mechanisms. So... Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's just not good system design. And the other reason why this is a kind of a big a, a, a concern is because building in a solution to this would be very, very easy. Um, having a withdraw function that you could call at any time in order to redeem your tokens for the kind of current share of the Ether and also claim future rewards would uh, be a really elegant fix. Right, so so you could have a very actually a very simple way that you should say, okay, I'm gonna withdraw my ether and then have some address that all the all the rewards get redirected through in proportion to what I had, and and that's and then that's fixed. And if you you mean if you don't have that separate step of creating a child DAO to withdraw money, yeah, then it can happen a lot faster because you don't need to wait like you know seven days to split, twenty seven days for creation, and then fourteen days for your proposal you could just kind of have it happen. That seems like a very straightforward fix. So is, is that something that it, there's kind of agreement on that that would be a way to solve this and that it's, that's how it's going to happen? Or is there seems, other problems It seems problems like there's that? a strong agreement forming around it. I, I, you know, I can't say like 100% for sure that that's going to happen, but uh, I haven't heard any, I haven't heard anyone who like thinks it's a bad idea enough to like defend, defend that, like their claim. Yeah, so I mean, the way the way we could think of it is like uh, in any system you have, you can have voice and you can have exit, right? Like you don't you're living under a government, you don't like it, you can either speak up, or if nothing good happens, you can exit. And the DAO kind of implements this by saying you have voice because as long as you're a token holder, you can vote on proposals and allocate money. That's your voice. And if you don't like the way the system is going, then you can exit. The problem here is uh, exits are complicated. A, they take a lot of time as currently defined. Uh, so they take something like 40 days to execute. And then there's also a particular attack once you try to exit. That attack could in theory be surmounted, but it requires a lot of technical prowess, which most of the DAO investors won't have, right? So, so uh, that, that, is the, that is the current situation uh, with the stalker attack. Today's magic word is moratorium. That's M-O-R-A-T-O-R-I-U-M. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So, uh, uh, what are the what are the other kinds of attacks you have come across? So, um, so as a, as a token holder, what I care about is that I'm able to vote correctly. 
and I'm able to exit correctly if, 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 if I need, right? So in this case, what we're saying is exiting has become hard and this has reflected itself by uh, having the DAO token price also go below uh, below the book value. So so today, if you if you look at DAO tokens, you can buy DAO tokens, and if you can exit out of the DAO correctly, you will get back more ether than you put to buy the DAO tokens today. And this is because like the exit, uh, the way to exit from the DAO is is really complicated, as demonstrated by this attack. The other side is like if I'm a token holder, the other thing I care about is voting and um, You've also identified some of some problems with the kind of voting system that has been implemented. So what are, what are these? So the big problem with the voting in the DAO is that it's biased towards yes votes. So think of a fund that wants to make decisions. It needs to capture the true sentiment of the crowd that it's uh, crowdsourcing from. And uh, to get the true sentiment, what you really want people to do is they you want their incentives to be aligned. That if they... If they see positive expected value in a proposal, they should vote yes without thinking. And if they see clear negative value, they think that this contractor will waste money, then they should vote negatively. They should vote on no. Um, the way it's structured right now, uh, the yes voters have every incentive to vote yes, the optimistic, happy crowd. That's great. The no voters, the sort of the, the financially minded, careful crowd who, who think that this thing is going to be a bad idea, um, they will lose certain rights if they vote no. And in particular, if they vote no, they get trapped. That is, they are unable to split. So you might, you might have the DAO faced with a terrible proposal, and, uh, and the yes voters will vote yes on it. You're looking at this, you're thinking, this is clearly a terrible proposal, I want none of this. But, but it would be silly for me to vote no now, because if I do, I'm trapped, and these idiots, if they vote yes, if there are enough idiots around, and if, if most uh, you know, sort of clear-thinking individuals are inactive, today or whatever during throughout the voting period, then, then you'll end up losing your money through that very proposal. So, so suddenly the situation is no longer symmetric and, uh, and the happy-go-lucky crowd might end up committing you to, to very bad proposals and uh, your best bet is to hold off on voting no. So then that creates a secondary issue, which is if you look over the timeline, you will see yes votes start to come in. And uh, if we're using the DAO as a signaling mechanism, which we are, right? We, we want this voting um, to poll the audience, and you want to be able to watch as the audience sort of brings in their votes. Uh, those votes will come in heavily weighted on the yes side, and the no votes will tend to come in towards the end, if they come at all. So this is, this is a huge issue, because it means that the mechanism is not incentive compatible. It's not truthful. And uh, what we call these kinds of voters, we call their behavior strategic. Uh, that is not the layman's kind of like, oh, that's clever and strategic. This is, they are doing something that is, that is not exactly um, uh, in line with what they should be doing. And, and this is bad behavior. It, it, it diminishes the DAO's ability to make sound decisions. You're hearing from one crowd, but not the other. And so when you say strategic voting, particularly what it means, right, is that I, as a DAO token holder, it might not be in my interest to vote, for example, against a certain proposal, even though I think it is actually bad for uh, you know, the DAO fund and for the returns that the DAO will generate because I have you know, some other concerns or some things I'm going to try to protect. Absolutely. That's exactly right. You, you can clearly see that this thing is going to bring negative value, but you're not voting that way. In fact, you choose to sit on the sidelines you might choose to split at some point if you if you see the yes votes pile up. The sort of the uh, the game theory behind what we will end up seeing is complicated, but uh, but we can all agree that the voting is skewed. That the yes voters there is no impediment to to their voting, and the no voters there is some structural impediment. We will always hear from them late, and uh, uh, if they're clever, um, they might not even vote at all and split out. Yeah, and the the other the only thing that I want to add to that is to be clear that it's not just that you give up your ability to split, but you also give up your ability to transfer your tokens. So you can't sell either, right? Uh, and if you splitting is kind of maybe not great because you you have to like have a week notice, but you maybe would want so you have to if you think that something might pass and you want to split, you'd have to like kind of speculate a week before it passes. But for selling, like you can you can potentially sell like even a few days before it passes. Um, 
but you know, the closer you get, the more the market will have already reacted to the fact that this thing will pass. Um, so, you know, it's, you can't split or sell if you vote. And if you think that the DAO is doing great, then you don't mind so much uh, not being able to split or sell. If you're concerned, then, you know, you're more likely to be a no voter and you're, and you're there and you're also more likely to want to retain your right to split or sell. So this dovetails well with the second, with a, I guess we're on number three now. There's another attack that comes from this, um, which is if you vote on a proposal whose voting period is long, you know, so I ask, uh, I think there is currently a proposal on the DAO that says, do you believe in God? You know, it's, it's like a zero cost <laughs> proposal. And, uh, you know, you vote yes or no. Um, but what, whichever way you vote, you're trapped. This we call a concurrency trap uh, or a concurrent proposal trap. So once I get you to vote on this BS proposal, um, you're now in the DAO for good until that proposal is resolved. So one, one vector of attack would be I would put up a zero cost, goofy uh, proposal that lasts a long time. Uh, you feel instinctively sort of moved to vote on, oh, I'm an atheist, I hate that, or oh my God, this is my faith, whatever. Um, you know, some, some dumb thing that gets people riled up and moving. And the moment they cast their vote, um, they're in for, for at least the voting period, the end of the voting period. And now you can start attacking them with other proposals that have shorter durations that come in. So how, how would that work? What, what could another, like, let's say a shorter duration proposal, how could that be used to attack somebody that's been locked in? Sure. So uh, imagine that like, you want to get money out of the DAO with like a, a majority attack or a surprise attack. What you would try to do is get a bunch of people to be locked in so that they can't sell or split because then you're more likely to be able to have your funds when, you, when, you, when your proposal gets passed. So if I can lock, so imagine if I can lock down like 50% 50, 50 of the DAO and I have like some number of the tokens, I mean, uh, then, and I can get a yes vote on a proposal, then like some people who otherwise would be able to split like can't because they were, because they voted on the long, the long silly one. So, so that means I get my crazy proposal to pass and now all these 50% that have been locked in because they really wanted to assert their opinion on some stupid thing. Uh, and you know, my, my dumb proposal passes now they can't get out. So to the extent that they're invested, right, the proportional share is going to go into my proposal. That's, that's the scenario here, right? That's very much the scenario. I would like to add one request. If anybody does that after hearing this uh, uh, podcast, they buy us a drink. All four of us. <laughs> and plus Dino, of course, five of us. <laughs> yeah, like these are these are really interesting attacks. Like I, I, I would also like to make a restatement of the first uh, attack, which is uh, the bias against voting no. So let me let me just add one note before you do that. Um, yeah. So uh, if you uh, if you get these people to vote, then they they don't actually have an incentive not to vote in your shorter length proposal. And so uh, depending on your threshold it may or may not be a good idea to bribe them into getting locked because as soon as they're locked, they don't have a no bias, anymore, a yes bias anymore. So, Vlad, uh, I think there are so many attacks against the DAO that some of them cancel each other out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, but the, but the f uh, fundamental problem, I think, here is uh, the bias against, uh, against vote. So, uh, so... So the way you can imagine bias is like this. There's this. This the famous, uh, famous thing which is called a survivorship bias, right? A survivorship bias is that uh, in the Middle Ages or even now, they, like you find people that said, you know, I I prayed to God, I went to sea, my ship sank, sank, but I was saved because I prayed to God. You know, I prayed to God, some disaster happened, and I was saved from this disaster because I prayed prayed to God, right? But uh, but you can't see people that are the opposite that that prayed to God that some disaster happened and they ended up dying because once they are dead they weren't there to popularize the notion that they prayed to God met with a disaster and died right so in society all that you're going to see is people that say I prayed to God and I was saved the whole uh, like you know the natural system is sort of designed in a way to have us see only these kinds of people. Now, what, what you're saying out here is because a no investor has a cost, right? Once, once he votes no, 
he is locked in the DAO, he can't sell his share, he can't exit the DAO, etc. So, um, so we start to see that these, these kinds of people don't do anything at all. And, uh, and the signal that comes out from the DAO is always a positive signal that, okay, let's fund this proposal. It gets reported in all of the news media. Let's say there's a huge proposal, 20 million, and there are lots of yes votes. It gets reported in the news media. It gets covered on Epicenter Bitcoin. It gets uh, all of the publicity behind yes, because everybody seems to be saying yes. And ultimately that proposal passes just because the system is aligned that way. In reality though, there might have been many people that don't want for this proposal to pass, right? And that kind of selection bias makes makes the uh, makes the whole voting system of the DAO itself broken, right? Absolutely. So um, we would like to have a truthful mechanism for voting uh, that is symmetric on both ends, and um, that way you can count on people voting their uh, you know what what they perceive, and you can count on the outcome of the of the, the vote to, uh, to then be representative of what the crowd thinks about the idea. Any kind of bias like this, survivorship bias, the yes bias, etc., skews that whole thing, makes the DAO into sort of a dumber, dumber money uh, that can be lost uh, easily. So with, with the stalking attack before, there was an, an easy fix. Uh, or at least it seems with that uh, withdrawal uh, functionality, is there something like that here, or is this much bigger problem that is hard to solve? It's, it's considerably more complicated here. So there are techniques from game theory for how to solve it, and, uh, um, but uh, evolving from where we are now to one of those is not, this is not a two-week patch. This is, uh, there is some thought to be given. The game theoretic techniques for fixing this um, they typically require some secrecy of, of how things of, of at some point in the process. And uh, it's hard to achieve that secrecy on a blockchain. So, um, so I think there is going to be some research needed to come up with, uh, with uh, mechanisms that are, uh, that are truthful and, and are adapted well to, to blockchains. And, uh, and kind of like, like, like this, this, this problem, this, uh, this brokenness of... Um, of, of the voting system itself, uh, this this creates a very interesting dynamic today, right? Like, ideally, what we would want is that the voters, the, that the DAO members, be incentivized to upgrade the DAO, right? So we can always think that maybe, okay, the DAO has has certain attack vectors against it. Okay, that's fine and dandy. Um, they'll just create a proposal. Somebody will say, okay, I'll build a new framework to upgrade the DAO. Submit that as a proposal. Maybe walk away with like a few hundred thousand dollars uh, that the DAO will sponsor, and then this guy can build the next DAO framework, and then all of the token holders can adopt that DAO framework or something like that. So in theory, you could you could imagine that the DAO itself becomes a principal, and in order to upgrade, it recruits an agent, and then that agent allows the DAO to upgrade itself. But if the voting system itself is broken then we cannot rely on this self-upgradation path of, of the DAO itself, right? Because the basic thing, voting that's needed for the self-upgradation path itself is broken. So that's, that's, why, uh, that's why this creates like a chicken and egg problem of how do you really upgrade something in which you can't even elicit uh, the opinions of the community members efficiently. Yeah, so I think this is like, you know, one of the reasons why a moratorium is appropriate at the moment. Um, but uh, there is a couple of things that we can say. One of them is that uh, proposals that have, uh, you know, z spend zero ether um, are less prone to a yes bias. Although it's still bias against voting, it's just no longer towards yes or no. It's just so we'll probably, you know, the, the participation won't be very high. Uh, but there's not going to be a bias if it, sends zero, if it spends zero ether. And so we could solicit the DAO's opinion uh, without actually having a bias. Um, and then uh, in terms of the upgrade path, there's, uh, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a call in the contract where if we get 53% of the stakeholders to agree, uh, the DAO will be upgraded to a new contract and all of the ether, all the extra rewards, everything will go over there. 
regarding uh, upgrading the the contract, I guess another question here is what's actually the process here? Because I, I, right now there's a, there's a GitHub account where the, the code of the DAO is on. Obviously, the GitHub account isn't managed in a decentralized way, right? So they're managed by a few people who control that account, who can control, you know, whether pull requests get accepted there. Uh, how does that influence this whole process of upgrading the DAO? I mean, uh, technically it doesn't. I mean, technically, you know, you can call the uh, upgrade contract, you know, the upgrade contract call doesn't, doesn't know anything about the GitHub repos. I mean, um, it just knows about, like, contracts on the blockchain, right? So uh, the the question is more, uh, you know, what would it take to get the community support to the point where we have like a, you know, 53% of the tokens agreeing to the upgrade. Um, and I think that's going to take, you know, a, a lot of uh, clear communication and good education. Because I mean, this reminds me a little bit of the, the kind of situation in Bitcoin, right? Where you can say, okay, the Bitcoin core, you know, this doesn't have a necessarily a particular status who controls those repos. But then it does have actually a very significant importance because that's where people look for and that's where people turn to. And you have this kind of, uh, what do you call it, a shelling point. Mm. Uh, and, and then moving that somewhere else is actually really, really hard. Not Maybe not maybe in a technical level, this isn't an issue, but on a social level, uh, kind of, you know, coordinating everyone to, to sort of start uh, considering something else. I mean, maybe there's going to be nice tools developed here for the DAO that will make that easier. But, uh, I mean, I think if we look at Bitcoin, that has been, uh, that has been a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, in the case of the DAO, it's a little better. Um, but, uh, the sort of the, the frontline discussion, the voting and so forth, it's happening at consider dot it, what is DAO dot consider it dot whatever it is. Uh, it's, it's happening at, uh, uh, at, on, on different platforms, and um, you could, you could. Oh, and it's also happening on Reddit as well. It's partially decentralized, partially going through channels uh, with, uh, you know, managed by Slocket. Um, but, uh, but I think, you know, as you said, as as we move forward, we're going to build other tools, and um, this uh, this channel should be a little better than what we saw with Bitcoin. So, it's not possible, for example, with the DAO. Uh, to have happened the same thing that happened to to you know Blockstream and all, almost all the core developers, so um, it is it is its own thing now. And it has started. It's live. It's going. It's sticking forward. So uh, there is no no worry that somebody could usurp the DAO. Um, it, it it in my opinion it's broken at the moment. Um, it's it's limping along, but uh, it's it's nevertheless its own thing and it's decentralized and uh, and it's not uh, you know short of taking over the entire curator set and so forth, it's not going to be uh, easy to take it over. So, so, so it, may, it may be limping, but at least it's decentralized. <laughs> yeah, and, and, but, but realistically, I think you're right. I think that like the cleanest, most elegant way to do any upgrades is with Socket 100% on board. And I think that, you know, uh, that will very likely happen. A few weeks ago, we told you about the GTEC blockchain contest. We asked you to submit your blockchain startup ideas for your chance to win 50,000 euros in grant money from RWE, GTEC, and Globumbus. Well, over 100 startups submitted their ideas, including 16 of you, our listeners. Well, the results are in, and the winner of the grand prize is Arcade City, a project with the radical idea to cut the middleman out of ride sharing. And the runner ups are Cargo Chain, a blockchain destined to improve international trade, especially in the shipping industry, and Clippers, a decentralized permanent document storage solution intended to guarantee intellectual property without a middleman. Congratulations to the winners, and we wish you lots of success with your projects. If you have a blockchain startup idea and think Berlin could be the home where you, you are going to grow your company into a billion dollar behemoth, then make sure you check out GTEC or the GTEC Entrepreneurship Center. GTEC has a lot of programs, workshops, startup academies, uh, provide office space to help companies grow quickly, work on really innovative concepts. So make sure you check out their website, check out gtech.berlin, that's G-T-E-C, dot b-e-r-l-i-n and we hope to see some of you in berlin soon we would like to thank gtech rwe and Columbus for their support of epicenter bitcoin
So w- one question I have here is like, there seems to be a principal agent problem out here, right? So, so if you think about it, uh, before the DAO existed, there was just lock it, right? Now, once the DAO exists, though, now, now, now you have like a principal, which is like the DAO, and then there's an agent, which is like Slocket, and Slocket really wants to become that, become that agent because like, uh, they are they are coming up with all of these proposals that are security related, and they might come up with something that's also upgrade related, right? So, uh, so now you like you you have like two different entities, right? And uh, huh. And and because because they are like these two different entities and their uh, mutual interests may not may not may not be the same anymore, right? Like uh, they, they they might be different, right? And there might be other entities that come up with other upgrade mechanisms. So there there might be like three or four concurrent proposals that 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 come up, right? So this upgrade mechanism could itself be more complex and lead the DAO to be forked just on how. Uh, if there's a discord in the community as to how the upgrade should happen. That, that might be possible in some sense. So, um, but, but hang on, it's, it's the, the, the principal agent problem is not as bad as one might imagine. So the DAO is what it is. And uh, Slocket is, is at this point um, kind of like any other contractor. They have expertise over the code um, and they propose fixes. And uh, now it's up to Slocket to convince the community that they're capable of, of understanding the attacks on the DAO, admitting them, and then addressing them. And if they can do this uh, to the satisfaction of the community, then they can move the, the funds over to DAO 1.1 or whatever it is, or maybe the 2.0 version, which has a, has a slightly different mechanism for soliciting votes. So, um, so I hope that they can do this. Um, and. Uh, but we'll live and see if they're capable of doing this. It's uh, it, I, I'm a little a little worried that they were blindsided by so many attacks at uh, at the game theory level. Uh, but I hope that they will have uh, they will they will quickly find the necessary expertise to to fix this. Yeah, and I, I think uh, I think there's another principal agent problem that we should kind of talk about, which is basically, um, and it's not entirely clear what the relationship is, but like you know between the curators and the token holders, right? Are the curators meant to serve the interests of the token holders? Are the you know is uh, the curators aren't exactly chosen by the the token holders? The curators are you know initially they were selected by Slocket, but now they get to they're kind of self selecting. They get to like use a, their multi sig to rotate the curators. Uh, so it's not really clear like who the boss of the curators are. I mean they're kind of like it's not clear how the curators will be paid for their work either. Right? I mean some people would suggest that we. Uh, the curator get paid by the DAO, in which case the curator would be an agent of the DAO. Um, but it's not clear that that has, has happened or will happen or, um, or whether the curators today want, want that. Um, so there's there's definitely like a conversation to be had about like what is the role of the curator. So like in, in absence of a, of a salary for the curators, right? So, so, the, so the curators like, the original definition of the curators was okay. This is like a multi-signature account that is tasked with taking all of the people that want to send proposals to the DAO and like filtering that list to uh, a smaller list of uh, of addresses that we think are coming up with genuine proposals. Right? It was like meant to be like a filter. So now, but is that right? Is that um, right? We are so describing it because because. There's lots of different interpretations of this, right? So that's that's like that's an interpretation that I think is not the the most common. I think there's there are kind of there's like a few classes of of interpretations. One of them is the one that you gave, definitely not the most popular. Uh, the, the more popular one is uh, curators check bytecode and identities so that like the people who have proposals are identifiable. If if they say like commit fraud or something, then maybe we could use we'll be able to like track them down somehow, uh, and then. Uh, and just make sure that like the proposals that are being spent are really genuinely to contracts that are, correspond to the proposals, right? The payment addresses really correspond to contracts that are correspond to the proposals. Um, mm-hmm. So that's like one common view on what the curator should be doing. And then another common view is that the curators should be protecting the DAO against majority attacks. Uh, now these two things are actually kind of incompatible because if you believe that the curators are only involved in this kind of automatic function, then they can't really safeguard against majority attacks. You know, if you uh, the the question of whether or not it's their job to like you know take 
select some proposals based on their merit. Generally, people don't really don't really believe that that much. Um, so I have heard a lot of token holders say that they believe that uh, curators are kind of the human stopgap measure in case something goes wrong that we can't predict uh, and that we haven't kind of you know don't already have the logic in the DAO to deal with. So, like in light of all of these different interpretations, like uh, how does your role get defined, right? Like ultimately, you want like some kind of let's say charter from the community. Yeah, this is what we are tasked with doing, right? How how do you go to that point? And then if you're not being paid for it, then how does the incentives of the curator and the DAO ever align? Yeah, I mean, those are those are great questions. So, I mean, I think definitely we should try to solicit the opinion of token holders to, to see what they believe the curators should do uh, and then give the curators an opportunity to decide like, okay, is this something I'm comfortable doing or is this something where I think maybe the legal liability might be too much and I should maybe uh, step out of the multi-sig. Um, so I, th I think, uh, you know, and, and then I think also, yeah, how the curators get paid will, will, will also be, it will kind of factor into this somewhat uh, because like, you know, if the curators are there to make sure that the DAO earns a higher expected return by like, being really careful that only really great proposals get in the whitelist, then I feel like yeah, like it would make sense for the DAO to pay to pay the curators. Um, it depends on what the role is, and you know, whereas like perhaps if the role is just checking the identity, perhaps it makes sense for the proposal uh, person who makes the proposal to pay the DAO, pay the curator, right? Because it's like a, on a proposal basis as opposed to you know a service for the DAO. So it's it's how the question gets resolved about what the role is is going to feed into how the curators get paid. Um, and I think it's it's just kind of an unfortunate thing that's happened uh, because of, uh, I mean, I'm not exactly clear to me why. I think that some people might have just like opened up the curator page and like uh, just kind of trusted that the curators have their back because it says like they're on the top, like the curators will safeguard the doubt. I think some people who, you know, read the, the white paper and are really involved in the community really think that the curators should be doing almost nothing. But also there's people who are in the community who like believe that the curators are this stopgap measure that like, you know, where it's just like the humans in the code in case that something bad goes wrong. So let me chime in a little bit. Um, the sort of the underlying, one of the big underlying issues with the curators is uh, that they be in a position uh, to have as legal, as, as, as small a legal liability as possible. So to that effect, uh, they are not, this is, I think, in, in everything that Slocket has produced, it's fairly clear that the, the curators are not in a position to, uh, should not be in a position to exercise business judgment. They're not supposed to say, this is a stupid idea. Um, that is supposed to be left up to the crowds. And uh, so that makes sense. And um, so that's fine. Um, but then Slocket, when they realized that there were certain attacks possible, they realized the majority attack was possible. And, and we kind of glossed over this, and we should kind of mention this. In the original DAO paper, the way the curator abstraction comes about, is, or it gets introduced, is uh, they first talk about the following attack. If there is somebody who owns 53% or more of the DAO, then they can come up with a proposal that says, I hereby award 100% of all the DAO funds to myself, uh, the 53% holder. And then they vote with their majority, then they take all the cash, and then they go away. And so that leaves behind 47% of the holders in a, in a pretty terrible situation. And Slocket realized this, and then they introduced the concept of a curator. So um, at a high level, they did the right thing in some sense, because there is going to be no mechanism that can foresee, no automated mechanism that can foresee every eventuality. Um, it would be a folly to design a system with no human input at all. So, so I agree with, with their sort of gut sentiment. But they failed miserably, I think, in realizing how the majority attack could be waged. If I'm a 53 percenter, I would not go out and, and come up with a single proposal for 100 percent. If I did, then their defense works just fine the way they envisioned it. But I could just as easily come up with two proposals, one for 50%, the other for another 50%. And now I fly under the radar. And if you think, well, that's also kind of obvious, well, fine. What about I, I divide it down to 10 10% proposals and uh, then vote with 53% of the vote for each of them. And, you know, if anybody, I make them sound semi-intelligent semi and semi-attractive. You, you, you can make a deal with a company that's already somewhat looks legit uh, so that yeah. you don't need to... You know, you can have a, 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 a front that passes a smell test. 
Right, so the curators at the moment are tasked with the impossible. And this is one of the, the attacks that we outline uh, in our paper, that uh, just by plaintively looking at the proposals, they cannot tell what's a majority attack, what's not. And so if I may go meta-meta for a second, I think this also underlies a fundamental problem with the way Slocket has been approaching these problems, these issues. So I, I'm a professor, right? I teach people. And uh, one thing that I see time and time again when I talk to students and I try to teach them synchronization. This is a difficult topic. Uh, it requires sort of writing correct code that can be invoked at any time, kind of like writing smart contract code. So uh, you identify a problem to a student. And if the student is a green student, they just arrived, they don't know anything, you know, or you know, they're just a sophomore or whatever, and you say, look, terrible event X can happen. And then they immediately go into this mindset where like, oh, X happens here. I'm going to make X not happen. Uh, and how does X happen? Well, X happens because A happens, then B happens, then C happens. I'm going to put a check in between B and C. And they think this is a good way to, to sort of handle a fundamental problem. And I have to teach them. It takes about a year of real hard work to get people out of this mindset, out of this case-by-case -case thinking. Because then what you have are these, you know, they go into this voice. It's like, you know, it's always a thin voice like this. They start talking like this. Well, yeah, that can't happen because then A would have to happen and B would have to happen. But I put a check there so it can't get to C and therefore X cannot have. This is crazy. This is not how you design secure, robust systems. Secure, robust systems stem from some global invariant. You just say X is not going to happen and I have safeguards for it everywhere pervasively. Not one of these like case by case by case things. So the curator abstraction, if you ask me, came about because of this case by case thinking. Uh, some of the case by case thinking, some of the instincts, the gut instincts of the developers are right. You know, when your, your uh, checks uh, that you have programmatically introduced are going to fail, and they will fail, then you need the human touch at some point. You, you need to bring that in in some fashion or another. Um, but the way it was done here is, is strange, if you ask me. So, so your point is that we need something like a curator, but their role would be different or should be different. And do you have a, a view on, on what that should look like or where that human intervention should be in the system? All I can say is it needs to be defined. And uh, Vlad is working really hard to, to sort of try to define the roles of the, the role of the curators at the moment. Um, I don't want to do thinking or research and, and research on the fly here, uh, but I can certainly come up with different techniques if, if, if we sat down to, to do this. Um, but at the moment, the curators, I believe, are flying blind and, uh, and they're in a tough situation when they're faced with a difficult decision. What do I do? Is it my job to, to comment on this or do I ask the crowd? Which one is more in line with the Dow thinking? Which one is more in line with legal responsibilities? Uh, even though most of us hate to mention that, there are legal responsibilities that fall on the shoulders of the curators. How do we do this? It's not clear at all. So we need a spec for the function of a curator, a specification. Yeah, and the, the, the interesting thing is that, like, you know, um, different, different token holders have different opinions about you know what that should be and like you know ideally like everyone would be on board uh, on exactly what it is right the token holders and the curators and you know a socket um and i think that um you know what, uh, one thing that we should maybe spend a moment thinking about is like the, what is the power of the curator like what at most could the curator do right so like at very most the curator has complete control over the whitelist you know the order in which things get whitelisted the duration for which things get whitelisted when things get unwhitelisted they have like a relatively uh, clear ability to control the order and frequency of proposals. Now, I'm pretty sure that everyone agrees that like this isn't what the curators should be doing, uh, especially because like the order and frequency of the proposals, if the DAO wants to spend his money at a certain rate, will determine exactly how the DAO spends money. Uh, and you know, I think everyone agrees that that's not the role of the curator. Uh, at the moment, like the curators are not at all at determining or aren't prepared to determine, like I haven't even begun to organize to determine the order of proposals to the DAO. And I don't think that's something that ever we want to see. But it's important to realize that the curators have a tremendous amount of power. And so the scope that we have in defining the role of the curator is very large. Uh, and I think that, you know, we need to be careful uh, that like, you know, we don't have the role be so broad that the curators can 
do anything and be responsible for anything. Um, but also, we don't want it to be so narrow that the curators can't uh, prevent, you know, these kind of outcomes that haven't been accounted for. So like like this this ties into the next section that we want to go at least like path forward right like so we have all of these uh, kind, of, kind of complicated questions that are that are that are coming up right like how how does the role of a curator get defined and the other the other big question is um, like what do you think happens if the moratorium succeeds like like you are calling for a moratorium on any proposals to the DAO at all now. Uh, what would you do once it succeeds and what do you think uh, what kind of uh, avenue of uh, opportunities does the moratorium open and on the other side if it doesn't succeed what, what kind of things does that open so um you know i think that like today we do de facto have a moratorium because like uh, curators haven't started whitelisting yet although they ha enough of them haven't like agreed publicly that they will support the moratorium for it to be you know, approvably a thing that has happened. Um, but I think that, like, the kind of ideal case would be that, like, we in the, you know, as soon as possible, come out with a fix for some of these security problems that gets, like, the 53% threshold vote to upgrade the whole contract. Uh, and, like, if that happens before any proposals to spend money, I think that would be, like, an amazing outcome. Um, that is, like, one possible thing, and but that would require consensus widely between token holders and, you know, uh, people who understand the DAO about like what the appropriate short-term solution is, um, and uh, so like that's well, that's one pot potential kind of outcome. Um, the you know, but you're right. Like curators could decide that like they don't they don't want to hold a moratorium anymore, and they can start whitelisting proposals. And then basically the uh, if they do that and there's still a yes bias, then like it might be that they are determining by choosing the order of the proposals, uh, how the DAO is spending money. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's, it's hard to say what, what are all the possible things that could happen. It's much easier to say what, like, we should aim for, which is that, like, we quickly form a strong consensus about what to do and execute it and have the, you know, a 53% quorum in the contract vote for an upgrade. Um, so in my opinion, the road ahead is a little complicated. Um, it's not going to be an easy fix. So we can, we can patch certain things in the short term. Uh, there are some immediate, mostly non-controversial things we can do uh, to make the DAO provide more reassurance to people that they can get their funds out when they need to. Um, but in general, the problem of building a good, robust system that can ask the crowd and get healthy responses back is, is far from a, a done deal. It's, it's, it's a complicated topic, and uh, it might well be beyond the reach of, you know, many small teams. Um, so so there, is a, there is a lot of work to do ahead. And uh, um, I was going to mention even the, even the fact, so for example, um, even on a good day, you can have strange behaviors in a system like the DAO. What's a strange behavior? Well, look, strategic behaviors, people not voting what they think. This can arise from the fact that there will be multiple concurrent proposals and people might have preferences like I want, I want these two pro proposals to get funded only if they both get funded together. And so that might cause people to vote in strategic fashion even when there is no malicious actors, even when everybody wants the best for the system. Um, given their evaluations, given their subjective viewpoint, they might be driven to vote no on proposals that will bring money to the DAO. So uh, trying to curtail such activities is actually really, really difficult. Designing that kind of a mechanism is non-trivial. And uh, I think we'll live and see if, uh, the, if the Slocket folks can pull it off or if some other team can come up and uh, propose an alternative suggestion. So just, just to be clear, I mean, Good and I, I think, are in complete agreement. The, the kind of narrative that I just gave has just to do with the short-term fixes rather than the long-term kind of let's make the voting system like you know, uh, state-of-the-art voting system. So what are your views on, on how long that's going to take to, to get to a system that's really robust and that goes, maybe fixes some of these, uh, the yes bias and some of these other more fundamental problems? Is that a matter of uh, uh, six months, a year, or is, is that a much bigger project? Um, I, th I think you 
need to be a little more specific about what fixes you want, right? So, I mean, we could, I think we could have a withdraw function very soon. Uh, I think the yes bias will take, you know, so withdraw function, or if we yes bias on the order of a small handful of months, uh, 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 but like some of the other things are, I mean, even the yes bias thing, and if under certain conditions is uh, a quite tricky research problem. Uh, so, you know, anything more than anything more than just the withdrawal, I think, is is kind of unknown how long it'll take to fix. Entirely agreed with Vlad here. Those are the right timetables. I don't think it's going to take more than a year. Um, and uh, but as Vlad mentioned, there are some quick fixes possible, which we should apply very very fast. And uh, and there's some medium term on the order of months kinds of issues uh, that need to be addressed. All right. Well, uh, thanks so much, guys, for uh, guys for joining us. That's that's really exciting, and I think it's exciting to have this this new project where so much activity is going on, so much research, and and uh, another way of actually looking at what's going on with the DAO is this is kind of the first real uh, large scale attempt to do decentralized governance. No, which is is a topic that we've often asked about in the context of Bitcoin, and unfortunately, it's it's hard to do in that context. Uh, but this is, is hopefully going to build a lot of the tools that will power all kinds of decentralized systems in the future. Absolutely. This is a fantastic experiment. So let's not lose sight of the bigger picture here. Um, no such thing has ever been attempted. Uh, we have never seen anything of this kind, of this magnitude before. Uh, we've never seen any financial instrument uh, with these, this, th these particular properties before. It's decentralized. It has a life of its own. When we wrote the paper, we were working against a deadline imposed on us, not by any person, but by a computer program. We had to finish that paper and get it out the door. Um, it was, by the way, it was one of the, the worst papers I have ever written in terms of, you know, like the, the amount of, well, in, in terms of presentation and so forth, right? It, it, for it to be an academic publication, it needs much more. But we had to go and publish it because the deadline was being imposed by this weird entity called the DAO. You couldn't negotiate with it. You couldn't push it back. So, uh, so it's really odd. These things have now entered our legal system. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun for a bunch of lawyers to figure out how to, how to integrate these with, with what we, the, the institutions we currently have. Um, there's this question of, you know, if, if corporations are people, then what is the DAO, right? Um, there are a bunch of other exciting things coming up. So this is going to be a, a, a fantastic field for a whole lot of people, but for technologists especially, um, this is a, a fantastic new opportunity. So let's not forget that in the, you know, while we talk about attacks and so forth, the attacks are important, they're significant, um, but, but we kind of understand the process by which we address, we can address them, uh, and we're, at least some of us are making efforts to try to move in that direction. And overall, the big picture is this is fantastic. It's just, just so amazingly new, amazing uh, features are embodied here that uh, it, the, the opportunities are really, really exciting. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I think, it's, I think it's super exciting and super fun and super interesting. And, you know, I think that, like, a lot of people are having a really fun time kind of about, like, how cypherpunk this is. I mean, this is, like, you know, uh, super exciting by all, like, standards in terms of, like, you know, people who are into like decentralization and uh, kind of peer-to-peer -peer crypto systems for managing like real stuff. Cool, excellent. Well, thanks so much for, uh, for coming on, guys. It was great having you on again, and I'm sure I'm sure that will not have been the last time. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Mayor. It's been really nice. Yeah, so uh, Epicenter Bitcoin is part of the LTB network. You can find this show and, and many other shows on letstalkbitcoin.com. We put out new episodes every Monday. You can get those through your favorite podcast app or watch the videos on youtube.com slash epicenterbitcoin. And we are still running this uh, t-shirt contest. So if you leave us an iTunes review, just email show at epicenterbitcoin.com and we will send you a t-shirt. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.